everybody's ready to go. Um, this is June 17th, Curtis Board of Supervisor regular meeting. The Board of Supervisors and its committees are subject to the Open Meetings Act. I'm going to call this meeting to order. My name is Jerry Fox. I'm co-chair and fire supervisor. Introductions on my left. James, James Water, uh, Roads and Utilities. Mike Hershington, Land Use Supervisor. And on my right. Aaron Boone, Fire Supervisor. Good evening, Christina Hendrickson, Parks and Recreation. First up, uh, we have disclosures. Anybody have any disclosures that they know of? They can also bring up during the meeting if they... I will uh, I will disclose what I typically disclose. Mm -hmm. So in, in new business item 10, uh, my spouse is a employee of the architects, part-time employee. Okay, first agenda, we have the agenda approval. And I think we want to make an amendment to this agenda, Mike. Yes, I'd like to um, suggest that we add an item into um, old business, which is an update to the uh, resolution we made last November about um, requesting bear resistant trash cans in Goodwood. There's a um, there's an ordinance a public hearing tomorrow at the assembly, and uh, what I want what I wanted to do is just update the language so it matches the language of that ordinance. Or that ordinance. So we can, we'll have a, a resolution which asks for something very specific and we'll have the ordinance hopefully go through tomorrow. So, so that'll probably be item nine and a half. Second. Okay, all in favor of making that change and approving the agenda as written other than that? All right. Okay, next up, minutes approval. We have the May 20th regular meeting minutes. Give a second for people to look them over if they wish. Make a motion to approve the meeting minutes from May 20th, 2019. Second. All in favor? Okay, next up, announcement. Public is encouraged to ask questions and provide comment. Please raise your hand and wait to be acknowledged. Please take side conversations to the foyer. GBUS Nonprofit Recreation Grass Cycle 2020 is open and closes June 21st at 3 p.m. Uh, applications are online and at the Post Office Library Community Room Bulletin Boards. The MOA GBUS Quarterly Meeting is Monday. July 29th at 4 p.m. at Anchorage City Hall on the 8th floor in F Conference Room. GBS this summer has its budget meetings. The first budget meeting is Monday, July 8th at 5.30. Second budget meeting is Monday, July 29th at 2.30 in Anchorage City Hall. That'll be before the municipal meeting. The third budget meeting is Monday, August 12th at 5.30 and uh, approval of the budget will happen at the regular meeting in August, the regular GBS meeting in August. The nonprofit grant presentations will take place on September 17th on a Tuesday here at 7 p.m. in the community room. And we will then. Sorry, I have a request to possibly change one or two of them. Okay, just I'll do the last one. Vote, okay. We will vote on the specific grant allocations on September, October 2019 regular meeting. So. Um, July 8th, I had a work trip come up. Um, I'm here the whole next week after that. I don't know if we could switch it to that. Um, otherwise, I will miss two out of three. We have GBOS the 15th because of the way July falls. We have Monday, so GBOS is on the 15th already. Mm -hmm. And so... I am available that week. Week of the 8th or the week of the 15th? The week of the 15th. The room is open on the 16th. Jerry okay. Spratt's got the beer ground with the Mellon Brewing Company that night. I, I, will not, <laughs> I will not be available on the day. On the 16th, not the cover. <laughs> during the day? Well, yes, it's kind of a... During the day? During the day, are you available or not no, at all? No, I have a... I've I'm available the 17th uh, and 18th as well. The Wednesday and the Thursday of that week. I'm sorry, it's the 15th of the week. Can we schedule this later? We don't need to do that now. <laughs> <laughs> 
talk about it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we can do it. We could do another doodle poll, I guess. If I feel bad. I'll send another <laughs> poll out. Okay. Right, that one. What and about, then, didn't you have another date that you were? Yeah, the nonprofit grant presentations. I will be gone until the day after that. Um, I would like to try to be there for this. Um, but I haven't made the last two updates. I've listened, listened to the recording, but any other time that week, I'm available. I'll pitch some dates. Okay. Thanks, Great. Margaret. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, introductions, presentations, and reports. Subcommittee reports, three minutes each. Start with Carolyn. I saw she's here with the Trails Committee report. Hi everyone, Carolyn Brodine, Chair of Trails. Um, so yeah, our meeting this in June was great. We had a work session instead of a sit in, the, in here and talk meeting. It was super productive as well. In fact, it was a very good case of many hands make quick work. Kyle had lined out what he thought was an hour and a half of hard work for us, but there were so many volunteers showed up, we actually got the project done in about a little less than that. Um, it was working on the damage that had been done by flooding to the um, phase one of the Idaho Rod Trail down by Old Kirkwood. I recommend anybody who hasn't been down to check it out should go down there. The um, new bridge is almost completely finished and Andy's working away at phase two. Um, I'll let Kyle give in more details about that and also update on the hand tram. Um, the other thing I want to say is we're just starting to talk for our June second or July second meeting, an, another work party in the evening, and we're now talking a ribbon cutting on the bridge um, at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. More details about that will follow. The other thing we've been working on, um, Trails Committee formed a subcommittee to apply for a grant for signage on the Beaver Pond Trail, and um, I'll be talking about that later in the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, land use, I don't see Brian. Hi, I'm Mary. I'm vice chair on the land use. I don't think I've presented here before. Um, we had a very quiet land use meeting on Monday. There were only a couple people there, and both of them were presenting. So <laughs> all of the agenda items that night were also on the agenda tonight. So there's not much to report on Monday. Thanks, Mary. Uh, legislative report. Jennifer Johnson, Kathy Easel, John Wilton, Susan LaFrance, and I see Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Adam Lees. I'm Suzanne LaFrance's assembly aide, and I got to spend all day here today hiking 9.5 miles around Winter Creek and drinking at the brewery, and I am very happy right now. <laughs> More so than I normally am. Um, la oh, come on. You guys are already in on it. And uh, this is my last meeting. I will be moving to Virginia next month to pursue a call for a three-year program in seminary. Um, and it is very, very hard to leave Alaska, but in summer, it's even worse. <laughs> um, June 4th meeting of the assembly was fairly quiet, but we do have some interesting things on the back burner and coming up at the meeting tomorrow the 18th. Um, starts at 5 o'clock. If you're sane, you will get there much later than that. Uh, the big one that I know is interesting for Goodwood is the secure trash ordinance. Right now it's at item 14M on the agenda, so that's the new business. It's the very last item on an agenda that already includes issues involving Merrill Field and on-site marijuana consumption, where there's a lot of worry that it will be, um, or it's very likely it could be knocked off just by the meeting running too late, being pushed to the next meeting in July. That being said, we do encourage folks to come out for it anyway, um, to submit written comments if you can't or if you're saying don't want to fight the mini winnies all the way into Anchorage to give public testimony, um, written testimony is allowed. Just get it to the clerk's office or email all the assembly. It does make it into the packet. Um, I also boned up a little on the ordinance so I can answer some questions on logistics or try to anyway. Um, next one up, the Tobacco 21 ordinance. This is still working its way through the Health Policy Committee. Um, they've been having a lot of very productive conversations with various civic groups on this. Um, this uh, ordinance would increase the age to legally smoke tobacco to 21 and also add in to our current tobacco code um, e-cigarettes, e-cigars, pretty much any e 
smoking product, which is filling a massive gap um, that exists at every level of government so far. Um, hopefully being the first step to some other reforms on that one. Uh, Suzanne's one of the co-chairs of that committee, um, and this is definitely a project she's put a lot of energy into, so we definitely would encourage, especially on this one, um, any feedback, positive, negative questions um, to help make this a really good ordinance. Uh, tomorrow, uh, this will get voted on because it got knocked off by another very long meeting on the 4th, but the Marijuana On-Site Consumption Ordinance, um, both of them are coming up tomorrow. Uh, it's very up in the air. There's really no indication whether they'll be approved or not. Suzanne Suzanne's a no vote on this one, and this one is mostly focusing on the fact that right now there's very little way to enforce uh, driving while under the influence. She actually sat on a jury meet, uh, she sat on a jury that had to decide one of these cases and learned very firsthand the limitations of what they have. Right now, the only way to really even get near testing for intoxication on uh, THC is a blood draw. There's nothing like what we have for field sobriety tests for alcohol. Uh, and it made the work for the jury, just in that case, very hard. So enforcement's a big issue there. Um, the other is since Anchorage is really the first one to go, and this was a really limited one, we're dealing with a lot of different issues as far as our enforcement limitations. The state is stepping back on several measures already. We're already filling highway patrol, just as an example. Um, so there's a sense that Anchorage may not just be up to actual proper enforcement of this, and you really don't want something that could be a good thing to go down in flames just because there's no way to police the bad actors in it. Um, obviously though, feedback's still welcomed on that, um, and we definitely, you know, this will happen closer to the beginning of the meeting, so if this is an issue um, which you're passionate about, please do come. Um, I think it's items 13A and B on the agenda, so they'll likely be handled between 6 and 7 o'clock, depending on what else happens before then. The next kind of big thing you'll see on there is there's a slew of ordinances and proposals on redistricting. Right now, the assembly, the charter provides for 11 assembly meter, uh, members and basically lets the assembly within the bounds of state law decide how they apportion it. Several decades ago, they decided there would be five two-member districts and a single-member district that would rotate. Except there was nothing to bind the rotation. So it's been stuck in downtown for the last several decades, which has left downtown with only one assembly member. So once they roll off, the institutional memory is gone. There's no one they can rely on. If they don't show up, the um, entire area is without it. Um, so right now, there's several that will be either postponed indefinitely or postponed for several months. One ordinance is being introduced. It would require a charter change, but it would create six two-member assembly districts after the next um, census, which is next year. Um, once the numbers come back, the assembly as well as the state both have to redistrict themselves to account for their populations. Um, so obviously there's a lot of time to deal with this, um, but if it's a charter change, it would go on to it. If you're interested in any of this, definitely you know email us. Um, contact us in some way. We'll be happy to give you any kind of openness on this. I know this one is favored for several reasons, and the big one is it's fair. It gives every part of Anchorage equal representation on the assembly uh, per population. The other is a good thing is, you know, we have two assembly members here in Girdwood and the rest of South Anchorage. They can really split workloads if they work together as a team. If one rolls off or one is voted out of office or for some reason turnover happens, you don't lose all of that knowledge of the recent issues um, and the connections, and it can really help the other assembly member when they're onboarding, kind of jump into it faster because there's you basically you're drinking from a fire hose if you get elected to the assembly. <laughs> Those are the big ones I have. Um, be happy to take any questions or bring any concerns or comments back to Suzanne and John since they do share everything. On the, sorry. On the, um, on the redistricting question, I think the public hearings have already happened for that. There have been several that's already happened. Um, there's a new one that was just a, that will be introduced tomorrow. So the public hearing, I want to say the next assembly meeting is July 2nd, but around 4th of July they move, so I don't know if it's the 9th. Um, so essentially they're going to postpone indefinitely, or the plan is, or at least postpone everything that they have, and that one will kind of be the main vehicle. Okay, so we're still it'll still be two member districts. Because obviously the other the other side of that is um, 
you know, we're, we're, um, there are far more people in South Anchorage than go. So we are three percent of the voting population or something. So we get the assembly members of South Anchorage decide we're going to get. We have very little, almost no say in that, practically, because we're such a small number. Whereas if they were single member districts, we would have more influence. Still not very much, but we would have at least more influence. We're lucky, I think, in the, our assembly members, but that isn't always the case. I would like to think you're very lucky right We're now. Very lucky yeah, right no, now, it's but that um, isn't always the case. And may not always be the case in the future. No, it, it's a distressing thing for small communities and larger districts. I mean, this happens down here for the Senate and the and the House districts as well. I mean, the weight's just. But with the House, we have one. We, it's a much. It's a third the size of the um, Assembly district. Yes. So we have uh, a lot more say in that. And less so in the Senate, but even less so in the Assembly. The Assembly districts are bigger than the Senate district or that. Yep. We have three full House districts, more or less per Assembly district, for two member district anyway. And then for anybody new in the audience as well as in the listening audience, can you say how to properly submit comments on the bear resistant containers to the Assembly? I can. Um, you can contact the clerk's office, and I, th oh, man, I always forget the email assembly for that one. Um, I think the all assembly address is mmwas at muni.org. I have a feeling Margaret is also really good at this sort of thing, <laughs> but I won't volunteer her. She well, it's on, the, it's on the municipal website. It's on the municipal exactly. website. You can also email, um, and if you email or contact the mayor about any of these things, definitely remember to include Suzanne or John or both, just because stuff that goes to one side does not necessarily go to the other, just because they assume it already does. Um, you can also email John and Suzanne. It's suzanne.lafrance at anchorageak.gov or lafrance s at muni.org. They both still work. And John's is weddletonj at muni.org or john.weddleton at anchorageak.gov um, to get your comments in. Um, but the clerk's office is the one to go to. And if you ever have any questions about anything, the clerk's office is phenomenal. Thank you very much. I have a comment. Thanks for coming down. Always oh. for the last hour. Thanks for giving me an excuse. <laughs> and thanks for keeping us in front of the assembly and good luck in your future endeavors. Thanks. Safe travels. <laughs> thanks. Bye, um, next on the agenda is Girdwood Area Plan Update. Eric Fulton or Janice Crocker. I don't see either one of those. Do you have any updates, Mike? Um, I know there's a meeting coming up. Yeah, there's a meeting coming up. Um, the last meeting kind of closed out phase one. Um, we have secured funding from the assembly um, to continue uh, paying for professional help um, during phase two. We haven't exactly decided the, uh, the work package for phase two, makes it under discussion. Um, we'll provide more information at the next meeting. Looking right here, I wrote it down, I think, today. The next meeting is the 26th. I think that's not right. It's going to be on the Thursday, so which I think 27. is the 27th. So there'll be an update coming to that email list, okay. and it'll be at 6 o'clock in this room. Okay. Thanks, Margaret. Is that it, Mike? Yes. Claire, you're up. Library report. Hi everyone, I'm Claire Agney, I'm the Garish Library Manager. Uh, the Garish Library was open for 171 hours and had 2,565 visitors for the month of May. It's still summer discovery time for kids and adults. Uh, come and get your reading log and read and be active during the summer. Fill out your log, turn it in by July 31st. Adults, you can win a Kindle Fire. We have a winner per branch, so Girdwood people have a very good chance of winning. <laughs> and uh, kids have a variety of prizes and they get a book when they finish their log, which is awesome. Our summer discovery programs for kids are Wednesdays at 3.30. This week we have uh, the magician Don Russell. Next week we have a really cool Alaskan animal coming. I've been told what it is, I'm very excited. And then uh, July, we have another magician, author, author Steve Scheinkin will be here. And then another dance party by DJ Spencer Lee. So that's a lot of fun. As always, every Thursday at 12, we have baby time. Every Friday at 11, we have family story time. This Saturday at 2 o'clock, we have a lecture, uh, Introduction to Permaculture. It's taught by Saskia Esslinger. She's coming in from Homer to do this, and it's a really big deal, apparently, in this world. 
<laughs> so if you want to learn more about uh, permaculture gardening, this Saturday at 2 o'clock, uh, Saskia will be here. And then another exciting one is Friday, June 28th at 11, we're showing the premiere of Molly Denali. It's a new PBS kids show that takes place in Alaska that features a native girl. Another cool thing is my brother-in-law sings the theme song. <laughs> So we get to show it before it premieres, and I think we're the first library to show it. So Friday, June 28th at 11, I'm excited for it. Uh, as always, if you have proctoring uh, questions, let me know if you're taking classes online or in town and you don't want to drive to take a test, come talk to me. And then as always, facebook.com slash aplgarish for all of our events and news. All right, any questions? All right, thanks. Thanks. Kyle, manager report. I'm Kyle Kelly, Gerwood Service Area Manager. Uh, starting with parks first. Um, if you haven't noticed, but uh, he's been out and about. David Parr is our seasonal employee, and he's out working uh, for us four days a week. So you'll probably see him out here with one of the MOA trucks moving around town doing different projects. So say hi if you see him out there. Um, we have both of our SCA crew interns with us, so Student Conservation Association interns, and they're working on our trail crew. Uh, currently, right now, they're working with Andy Henlin down on the Lower Ditterod Trail. And each day, they're making significant progress. I think they got another about 250 foot of trail in today. Um, so that's coming along really well. And they jumped right in and helped us with the um, bridge that just was recently installed down there. Um, so they'll be all over this summer. The next area that they're heading to is Beaver Pond to do brushing on the Beaver Pond Trail. Um, and Emily Maxwell is moved in and keeping an eye on the campground and the park for us over there is our park coast uh, by the pavilions. Um, our contracts, our weeds contract is underway. You'll see uh, our local contact is Julie Johnson. She'll be out doing invasive weed removal uh, through the summer. Um, so say hi to her. And um, our turf contractor has already begun and he uh, mostly mows on Sunday mornings, uh, keeping up with all our fields and facilities around here. Uh, we want to thank the 10 plus wonderful volunteers who came out and on June 1st and planted all the flowers through town. Um, 700 flowers were planted, uh, thanks to those folks and all those garden beds and planters in town square um, uh, were a result of them. So thank you for taking their time coming out and doing that for us. Uh, the baseball uh, field is in full use. Uh, we have hung new signs to uh, ask people not to have pets on the field. Um, we just had too many problems with that. Um, so uh, we invite people to uh, run their uh, pets through uh, the different trails and um, uh, disc golf here uh, if you like to to get out and do that. Um, and uh, as always, we're keeping up with projects uh, throughout all our, um, our facilities. And we just always remind people that like the skate park, the tennis courts, the playground, the soccer field, uh, we try to keep those as people only areas uh, just for the sanitary reasons, as you can understand. Um, Little Bears uh, Playground, uh, we are working through the assessment list on that. And those will be projects for us all summer long out there. Uh, we're keeping up with a little bit Alliance Club Park, uh, the tennis courts, we want to thank Gabrielle Hessel and the volunteers who came out and got the wind nets up for us out there. Uh, we have an ongoing discussion regarding pickleball court lines. Uh, we haven't come to any uh, resolution on that, but we are getting input on, on uh, what people would like to see there. Uh, and we plan to do a repair on the earthquake damage um, but just as soon as we can get done with some other projects. Uh, so we hope to tackle that here in the coming week um, and fix those cracks from the earthquake earthquake. Uh, the, new, uh, jo jump or the new box jump in the skate park is a huge hit. Uh, we want to thank uh, John Gallup for his continued work out there and uh, working with that. Blue and Gold held a skate event here on June 9th, which brought in additional donations for the park. So we thank them for uh, coming down and hosting an event there for the community. Um, as Carolyn mentioned, we had a great turnout for the June 4th uh, Trails Committee uh, project out there. Uh, they fortified the trail. We knocked it out uh, faster than I thought it was going to be, and it went really well. Um, and also along that trail, if you haven't been down there, a new bridge got installed over California Creek. Um, it was a real success.
us. Uh, we want to thank Paul Cruz for taking a huge lead on that. Uh, he got right after it. We want to thank Alpine Air for flying all the material in. We had nine sling loads. Uh, two of them were 1,600 pound blue lambs. Um, and my back never felt better after that all came in. So <laughs> thank you to them. And uh, Brian Burnett also for coming out. And then our SCA crew members uh, for helping to lead that. We knocked out the bridge build in three days. So it turned out really great. Uh, Andy Henlin has been moving uh, gravel back and well, bringing it in and driving out uh, for about two weeks. Uh, and he's getting closer each day and he's feeling better about that. Uh, but the work they're doing on the Laura Diderod Trail is really impressive. And uh, we appreciate their diligence and, and efforts to get that done um, and, and, and right on schedule. Um, we received a matching grant uh, from the Anchorage Parks Foundation for $5,000 uh, for the next phase two. It should be the section between uh, Ruane Road and basically up to the cul-de-sac here um, for the next section of the Lower Diderod Trail. Um, and so we hope to tackle that next year um, as we go forward. Um, and we want to uh, say thank you to uh, Christina Hendrickson for her efforts in initiating and taking the steps to find uh, funding for the Gerwood Trails plan. That's something that we see as a priority going forward um, and, and getting that project off the ground and running. So uh, it will go nicely to go into the Gerwood area plan as that gets developed as well. Um, and as always, the campground is open right now. Uh, we have a feed box and a station set up over there, but we do not host RVs. RVs can stay either up at Alieska Resort or up at Crow Creek Mine. Um, and we have signage over there directing them in those locations. Um, the hand tram. Unfortunately, on June 8th, we had a fatal accident out there associated with the hand tram. Uh, since then, the hand tram has been shut down and uh, we are going through evaluation process and inspection. We just completed inspection with building maintenance on Monday. We just received that report this afternoon, so we're going through it and we'll be making uh, assessment of uh, the next steps forward. So at this time, the hand tram does remain closed until we know more um, and, and, and uh, we hope to get it back open uh, very soon. So <laughs> we'll, we'll keep everybody advised as to where we go with that. <laughs> Uh, GBOS nonprofit grants. Uh, the current uh, uh, 2019 grants have all been issued. Uh, we have an opening right now for any of those who want to apply for the 2020 grant uh, until um, June 21st at 3 p.m. Uh, if you need a grant application, you can either contact us, go to the website. They are also posted at the library, community center, and post office. Um, and Margaret would be your primary contact for, for the GBOS grants, uh, recreation grants for 2020. Uh, other grants that we are processing, uh, uh, as I said, the California Creek Bridge is pretty much complete. We just have some hardware to install, but for the most part, we're going to ramp up that wrap up that grant, and for the most part, that grant is going to pay for um, all the materials uh, that went into that project. Our volunteer time and the donation we got from Alpine Air uh, will help to offset those material costs. So that was a seventeen thousand dollar grant. We'll be actually under seventeen thousand uh, once we complete the project. Um, the KM. TA spring grant, um, we received a $4,900 matching grant for trail tools. We bought most of the tools and actually our new power wheelbarrow just showed up and so uh, we'll be able to wrap up that grant as well. Um, and those tools have been in action uh, as we speak. So, um, and the RTP grant is funding right now that Laura Diderod trail and uh, we just submitted our first reimbursement with that. Um, so that, that one is underway as well. So uh, quite a few grants going on there and, and we also have a uh, Alaska Community Foundation grant uh, for $890 which is helping to offset costs with those trail tools as well so as always Margaret does a great job of keeping us updated with social media and website uh, all the information you can pretty much find there for all our committees and different uh, um, uh, work <coughs> or uh, things going on um, and then we also have GVOS online so if you like to watch our videos you can go to we have a YouTube uh, site that shows all the GBS uh, meetings on there. It's riveting. Um, <laughs> so uh, we've gotten lots of likes. And so like us if you are there, because we're always looking for views. Um, the cemetery, the cemetery committee is pretty much on hold now. They're trying to, they're working next with the Eagle River contingent in the Chugiak area to help uh, with their process of developing a cemetery. So um, as they get that going forward, uh, the Gerwood Cemetery uh, project will be a bit dormant for the time being.
Uh, switching over the roads. Um, road status, our road maintenance crew is currently working on, a, uh, will have begun a list of large drainage and culvert improvements um, and road projects. Uh, currently they're right now on Cortina dealing with a lot of drainage uh, repairs there. Um, and then they'll be bouncing down to Mount Hood and then over to um, uh, the uh, Timberline side and dealing with projects on that side. So they'll be bouncing all over this summer. Since the last meeting, they have applied calcium for dust control, spring grading of roads, pothole patch, brushing, cleared hazardous, hazardous trees and snags. Uh, um, they did the culvert replacements, they done asphalt repair, crack sealing, and last night uh, street striping was completed, as you might have seen in Town Square. Um, so that got done in the middle of the night. Um, major projects that we're working on right now, we are working on the Little Bears Glacier Hall replacement project over there for a new daycare facility. Um, we have completed the feasibility design plan. Uh, we are working right now on renderings, and still the goal is to put that in front of the voters for um, this coming April to do as a bond proposition to rebuild that uh, community building um, into a new facility over there. So uh, we are meeting with OMB. I am meeting with OMB to talk about that bond bonding and what that all requires uh, here in the coming week. So, so we're, we're still pushing forward on that project. Uh, the crosswalk pedestrian flasher system, uh, we have two phases. One phase is starting the day after Forest Fair, which will be the install of all the um, wiring system, the driving piles for the light and signs, and um, the cement foundations for the new push buttons. Those will happen the week right after Forest Fair. And then as soon as the material, like the flashers itself, and lights arrive from the lower 48, those will go up. Um, and we, our goal is to have the whole system installed by the time school starts. Uh, it'll take about a week on each of those two phases to get it completed and should be operational um, after they're done. So, um, and then quickly with uh, expenses, we have 198,000. We are, I've requested an audit of our undesignated fund balance, uh, which would include the undesignated funds that came out from uh, 2018. And so uh, I'll probably have that for you at the next meeting. Uh, in April, we spent 47,000 with the road contractor. Our expenses so far for the full year is 228,000 of the uh, road budget we've only spent 30 37 percent of the budget so far so we're looking good there and then our parks budget we've only spent 13 percent but that's because a lot of bills are all being processed right now that's one of our busiest time of year uh, for parks and then police uh, we've expended 25 percent we have a, a batch of bills that will be paid out here soon so uh, the, the basically the second quarter will be paid out and then fire uh, uh, they've been paid out for two allotments first and second quarter and they spent 37% of their budget so far. So our budgets are well within uh, where they need to be at this time. So, questions? Questions for Kyle. And this might relate to James too. Uh, I saw a bunch of the invasive weed bird vetch along the bike path, not only along Alaska Highway, but also down towards the school. I see in the notes from last time that Julie Johnson is our local invasive species collector, destroyer, or something this year. I know that the DOT contract for Alaska is separate this year, as well as for Alaska itself. They're doing separate contracts in the end stuff, but is there a way that we should note as a citizen who observed where the vetch is? Like, do we send a note to you or to Julie to communicate where we're finding it? Why don't you just drop a note to us and then we can get it to Julie. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. Easy enough. Because there's a large hawkweed between Monarch and Betty Sack. Oh. In the DOT right away? Yep. Yeah. I know that that's their primary area this year is they're really dealing with their DOT right away. Okay. That is U.S. Forest Service. There's several down trees on the trail, like straight up walking. Yeah, yeah. No, we'll pass along. I think they're aware of that. They do have a crew plan to go out there this year. Further questions for Kyle? I had a question. Um, obviously, it was a tragic accident at the hand truck. Um, on June 8th, and uh, obviously it, it makes complete sense that it's closed. And you mentioned that there might be a, that the inspection is being done. When is the next decision point for deciding whether what to do with the hand truck? 
Probably tomorrow. Okay. I, I, the, we received an inspection today about noon, and so uh, Bill Falsey and Chris Schutte, Chris Schutte is the um, head of community development, and Bill Falsey is the city manager. Uh, they're looking at it. They asked me for additional information, so I'm providing them with that. And so, um, but yeah, I think we'll probably have a discussion tomorrow. Yep. There's still a lot of things that we're just trying to uh, hammer out just to figure out where things are gonna go, but, but nothing solid yet. Further questions from the public or pals? Okay. Next up, supervisor reports. First one is public safety, that's me. Uh, I missed the last public safety meeting, but I read the minutes and Kyle uh, stood in for me. Um, the big thing is the contract and Kyle and I got together and called Todd Sherwood, he's out of the office until at least today. We'll I heard see. from him this afternoon. We'll talk about that, that agenda item. Okay, and that's on the agenda item. So that's kind of my big issue with public safety is just um, the contract that I'm working. Um, I don't know if there's anything. Well, I'll just let the, the chief talk. If you want to. Interim public safety director. <laughs> Uh, good evening, my name is Andre Shea. I'm with the uh, Whittier Police Department. Um, we're still trying to organize some of our stats with a new records management system. Just to give you a heads up for the uh, month of uh, May, May 1st to May 31st, we had 54 calls for service in the Kirkwood area. To date, from June 1st to now, we have 37 calls for service in the Kirkwood area. Uh, where the Whittier Police Department is currently investigating the tragic events that occurred on the uh, 8th at the hand tram. Uh, we did send an officer out with uh, Girdwood Fire Rescue uh, to the scene. So we are anticipating that report to be completed once we get preliminary results from the State Medical Examiner's Office. We will be completing and closing out that investigation. There's no indications or any signs of foul play involved. Uh, it was just a tragic accident. Uh, other than that, we're uh, gearing up for the events for the uh, Forest Fair. Um, we put out a schedule for our personnel here. We'll have full coverage with a minimum of two officers per on duty uh, at any given time, up to three officers. We currently have roughly eight officers scheduled to work that 24-hour period uh, to maintain the events and some of the traffic issues and congestion problems as well as parking issues. Um, in the last month or so, we've been meeting with Kyle as well as uh, Michelle Weston, the fire chief, here to address a primary issue and concern from the fire department side, which is the parking areas for their egress and access to subdivisions, because there are a lot of times apparently, um, from what I've been told, people park on both sides of the road, which makes it difficult for fire as well as ambulance EMS to respond to calls for service outside certain areas, including blocking a uh, hydrant access to the fire department. Uh, we're working on that. I know uh, the Forest Fair Committee has been in contact with the uh, State of Alaska State Defense Force, which is agree, uh, will agree, I guess, or potentially agree to assist in some traffic control. They've asked for the Whittier Police Department's um, in, insight on that. Uh, we have no issues with them assisting in traffic control, especially the parking issues. Um, I believe they're going to come up with a um, I guess monetary value to assess for that. Um, if you guys or the uh, great report supervisors agree with that, I would suggest at least a minimum of two uh, state defense force members that way. And their primary job, my recommendation would be strictly for parking uh, uh, issues and congestion issues, not for any law enforcement specific issues. That's our job as police officers. Uh, other than that, we'll support whatever efforts that the um, the Forest Fair Committee uh, has to make it more safer, if not only for people at the uh, campgrounds here, but uh, throughout Girdwood, just for the safe uh, transportation of any EMS or fire equipment and personnel throughout Girdwood. And that, that's about it. Thank you. Um, this, so let's talk about this um, Government Defense Force. Um, when I heard about this and Mike came in and talked to Kyle and I, um, one day, you know, what we said is kind of too late in the game for us to get involved. In other words, it's too late in the game for us to organize, be in charge of that force, and how we would do that. And so what we had said to Mike was that if you, 
as the Whittier Police Department would like to hire a couple of these guys and be in charge of them, we could talk about that. But we don't want to have any liability or supervision of that. I gotta talk to my boss on that. I'm not sure if that's gonna be an issue or not. Um, if they were volunteers, that wouldn't be an issue because they'll supervise them. You know, certain things my boss will probably ask is just like if you guys would hire someone who assumes liability, you know, insurance aspects, all that. So that's something we'll probably have to talk to uh, uh, Colonel Simon Brown, the State Defense Force, and ask them if we would hire them if they'd be a contractor versus an employee for us. So that's something I could talk to my boss and I got double check. I know one of my bosses are not in town, I'll check my other boss in uh, Whittier's in town. And we can discuss it with him. Does anybody else on the board have a comment on this idea? I agree that it needs to be a subcontracted so that there's a, a chain of command in the line to ensure that there's scope of work of particularly focusing on parking and not getting involved in any other law enforcement activity during such a busy weekend is followed through and recognized by the uh, IC that's going to be set up this yes. weekend. And I agree, no matter what, uh, we would probably, if they were hired, the Whittier Police Department would probably be the, their over, so direct oversight, any of the officers there, and would direct them to non-criminal activities, more parking and enforcement aspects. Um, so I will talk to my city manager on the other side of the tunnel and uh, ask for his suggestions, recommendations, and then I'll come back to Kyle and let him know. Um, and just for the board, and Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but the understanding was it would be $200 a day per person? Yes, per individual. Per individual. As opposed to 135, 132 day, 80 per hour. Yeah. But the concept is that uh, they are traffic management. There's no money in the budget, so they're going to have to figure out where it's 
coming from. Yeah, we could we could find the money, but we just have to we'd have to have a meeting and approve it, and the board would have to agree that we were going to help subsidize this event. And you know, one of the issues that came up in the last meeting was just, well, then what's going to happen when slush come, comes around? And is the resort going to say? We want you to pay for it to help parking, and I'm not particularly because the scope of this work would be parking not within the confines of the permitted area for the forest fair. This would be on the streets near the um, fire hydrants and everything that James had the idea of in the last meeting to just put out additional bollards in front of them in order to offset and keep people from parking in front of them. Could we uh, table this to see a contract or oh, see yes, a course. presentation and then, yeah. so and then make a special? Let's do this. That's because we don't even know if it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So let's just we're, mm -hmm. we're gonna table it, and there may be an emergency. You know, we'll have a, an extra meeting, special meeting. And I know on one the subject if. It's One happen. of the concerns that was brought up in is the military, because they're going to be in military uniforms. Mm -hmm. My goal is have them low key, just vests that says yes. traffic. Don't want any of the, you know, military policing aspects of it. They're strictly traffic controlled, just to assist and be nice. <laughs> so and that's what we're trying to portray. Um, and that's either way. If we, if uh, the board agrees with it, we will still supervise them. If they don't, we'll see if there's any other options. But we will still make a, a concerted effort to have my guys out there if they can do it. But I would strongly urge if you, to consider having someone else specifically set up for that. Yeah, daughter of a Joel Sergeant, I don't see my dad nicely enforcing parking. At yeah, so, <laughs> so and th that's one thing I, I want to make sure that's, that was our goal, um, bring the Defense Force out. Okay, so yeah, they'll just they go. Are not military yeah. Will they be armed? No. I don't believe so, no. Um, okay, any other questions? And we'll just table that one until later date if it even happens for the police chief. <coughs> other topics other than Forest Fair Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mike, do you have anything else to report? Not very much. Thumbs it up. Anybody else have any questions for public safety? Hearing none, we'll go on. Roads and utilities, James. I think Kyle covered everything. We approved the invoices and it seemed to be um, on board. I think that was it. He covered most everything. Oh, I have one comment. Hey, Chief. I have one comment that I wanted to say before you left. I have heard from everybody that your force was very professional in the tragic accident and I want to say thank you. And everybody that was there and there were a lot of people there said the Whittier Police Department handled it very well, the uh, Guru Fire and Rescue handled it very well, and the volunteers that were there were very helpful. So it was a tragic deal and just thanks. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Um, okay, next up, Parks and Rec. Christina. No so, further comment. Next up, Fire Department. Aaron. Uh, we've had a couple of fire meetings the last week. Uh, last week, I, Jerry and I attended the fire board meeting, and then just before this, we had our semi-annual uh, GVOS fire meeting. We covered about the same thing, so I'll just go through them quickly because uh, Michelle's not here. Um, we talked about AFD contract negotiations. Uh, the current contract with AFD was written in 2000, so it's out of date, needs to be updated. Uh, we're going to start working on that in September um, to accommodate schedules, summer schedules. Then we also talked about uh, Kenai Peninsula funding. Uh, when we, when the fire, Girdwood Fire Department goes out and responds to incidents on Kenai Peninsula, we're currently not getting reimbursed, and so Michelle is working with uh, Kenai Peninsula Borough to work that out so we can get reimbursed for that. Um, we talked about the budget, which um, so far looks to be on track for this year. Um, talked about the Girdwood Fire and Rescue bylaws, which the board is um, currently working on revising to um, bring them up to a point where they better serve the board and the department um, and so they can get signed, so they're a legal document. Um, Let's see. Oh, Michelle also mentioned the Woodlot will be open this weekend, June 22nd and July.
July 20th. Um, it's $15 a truckload and $20, $20 a trailer load. And the reason they're charging this year is because um, there's no funding through the Muni this year, so they're hoping to recoup some of the cost for having someone out there. Um, let's see. We talked about some equipment replacement uh, they'll need this year, uh, SCBAs, an air compressor, and turnouts, and they're still working on um, the best place to find funding for those. And um, let's see, they're also getting two e-bikes for um, emergency response. Uh, the resort reduced, uh, offered them at a reduced rate, and then the Car Foundation um, donated half the money they need, and then uh, the public donated about $475 towards the second one. So um, those will be good for um, trail-related incidents that they respond to. And I think that was about it. Anything else? Covered it. Okay, next up, unless there's any questions about for the fire department. Next up is land use. Mike. Um, I think the only general land use uh, comment I have is the, I'm going to say it was the last assembly meeting, maybe it was one before, um, the trapping um, ordinance was passed. So we now have a set of, we now have, um, we put a set of rules around um, banning of trapping within a certain distance of all trails, uh, trailheads, etc. Um, there's, it's kind of a, trapping's a weird thing. Uh, there's a, there's very little real rules and regulations, um, but there is a code of ethics. So under the code of ethics, um, things are exactly the same. There's still areas where trapping code of ethics wouldn't um, suggest you put uh, traps, but um, obviously we know they do appear. Uh, so now there's some enforcement power within the municipality, within the municipality owned lands. Um, moving on to the chapter chapter nine or title twenty one chapter nine parking requirements. Um, both this and the um, and the ADU uh, for housing for the accessory dwelling unit rules. These are both about to be submitted formally to the planning department. Um, in the case of parking, we've just done one presentation within our local. Um, process. Uh, it'll go into, like, as if it was a variance request or something else, it will go into the um, planning department. Uh, they'll do a staff packet, there'll be a hearing um, scheduled for PNC. At that point, we'll come back to the local process, have a meeting, discuss the discuss the staff packet and everything that goes through. Um, with the housing, we did it a slightly different way. We actually approved everything locally, and then it goes through the um, PNC process. So in both cases, there are plenty more opportunities to have public hearings and discuss it, both at PNC and uh, at the assembly. Um, the other thing is on the housing working group, we're looking at a couple of other issues. We um, we reviewed the um, the municipalities' plan for housing and how they're spending um, HUD money. Um, we're going to make more provide more input for the next cycle, for the next year's year of uh, grant funding. Um, and we also started discussing sort of the general landscape around uh, short-term rentals and uh, whether we should put them somewhere on the par with B and B's. And currently, for bed and breakfast, you need a permit. You need a uh, fire inspection. If you do short-term rentals, there's none of that at all. You just you just do it. You're supposed to have a business license, but it's unclear what our actual compliance rate is in that area. So we're we're gathering some data and looking at the looking at the problems and looking at how other communities have solved the issues around short-term rental. Okay. Any questions? For the trapping, was that just on state maintained trails or No, it's, this is done purely, this is the municipal okay. trail. So okay. it basically covers, it covers April B land and other municipality owned land, which includes our own um, land. So anything which is good with parks and rec, that's also under the same thing. John can tell us all the details. Okay. Actually, it's any lands within the municipality. So oh, is it? State park. It's not oh, really? city land. Okay. Well, I didn't know. Great, thanks for the clarification. Okay. I was going to say, since Sean is here, is there, should we see if there's see anyone who wants to ask me? <laughs> I missed his report. I covered. I covered secure trash times. We have on our, our agenda.
agenda tonight, the, um, we're going to talk about the bear or the trash. That's later. Yeah, yep. this meeting. I, I think uh, Kobe be sent up there. Sure. Hi, Radio Land, John Weddleton here. So uh, I, I think, did you talk about the secure loads? <laughs> secure loads? No. No, okay, so we have an ordinance. Um, you've got to cover up your um, loads so nothing falls off. <laughs> and the fine's now $150, and uh, if you don't have a secure load now, it goes up to 500 then 1500 then like 5000 So it's quite serious, you know, but we have trouble. I mean, we didn't think it was last year or the year before. A big rock fell off a truck and killed a kid. Kenai Peninsula, and we have trouble in the city. We have people testifying who have uh, gotten racks and brain damage and so on because of, you know, uncovered loads. And boy, you sure see it, you know, people just lose stuff in the back of their pickup truck. It's just bouncing around. So, um, so that's going to about to get a lot more serious. Um, and then just one thing I want to comment. We have a number of things for Girdwood in our packet for tomorrow. One is some changes in the uh, Title IX that are just, I think, about mineral extraction in certain areas that I think are just uh, recognizing what's already existing and it just didn't get in there. Uh, we sped up the silver tip uh, liquor license transfer so that they should have it ready in time for Girdwood Forest Fair. Um, but a couple of things. I think we got a letter on that, but it came late. I don't think you did it late, but it's really helpful for anything Girdwood to see what GBOS has. And I saw some things on the back table too. So I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it's what on the agenda for tonight. Okay. And also the mineral extractions on the agenda for tonight. Okay. And yeah, so so that's good. But we really do look for if it's a Girdwood thing. What does GBOS say? So we want to make sure we get those in. And I it seems like you have them dialed in pretty well. But um, so I don't know if we're missing it at uh, planning staff level. It's not getting in our packet or um, or some. But but it's important to have that because uh, you guys do good work and we count on your viewpoint on those things so that's the highlights any questions any questions for assemblyman thanks thanks john public comment person is offering public comment must state their full name and address public comment is limited to three minutes per person it must be on subject and not listed on the agenda julie good evening Julie Raymond Jacobian, Box 924. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody about the Muni's Historic Preservation Commission and that we exist. And um, I am a commissioner. Uh, there is no specific Girdwood seat on the commission, but I live here in Girdwood. And uh, Girdwood Historic Preservation and Cultural Resources are one of my main concerns. Um, so just wanted to let everyone know that um, our next meeting is going to be June 27th at 5.30 p.m. And we meet at the Municipal Planning Department on Elmore. And there is a call-in number um, if you're not able to attend in person. And that number is 343-6067. And the public is encouraged and welcome to attend. And um, yeah, I just also wanted to read our purpose for those of you out there that may not be familiar. The Historic Preservation Commission encourages and furthers the interests of historic preservation by identifying, protecting, and interpreting the municipality's significant historic and cultural resources for the economic and social benefit of the community. Um, so if anyone has interest or concerns about um, buildings, structures, historic sites, archeological sites, trails, objects uh, within the municipality, uh, feel free to get in touch with me. I'd be happy to talk with you about that. Um, best way to get a hold of me right now is probably through um, Kyle or Margaret or the planning department at the Muni. And what else? Oh, we will be holding one of our upcoming meetings here in Girdwood, probably in August, but that's not for sure yet. Um, so we'll announce that when we know it for sure and encourage people to um, come to the Girdwood meeting if they can for sure. Thanks. Questions? Yeah. Is that, are they held monthly? Yes. The meetings are the fourth Thursday of every month at 5.30 p.m. except for we have no July meeting. Thank you. Thanks. 
Okay, old business. Uh, first step is review of progress and negotiation with Whittier Police Department, contract, police services. This is going to be on the agenda for a while now. We're just going to keep it there to keep reminding me to keep working on it with Kyle. <laughs> so, um, Kyle, you said you talked, you made contact with yep. Todd today? Todd was just going to clarify with his uh, supervisor to make sure he would be the point person to handle this. Otherwise, DNS handles a lot of contracts, and so we may work with D. But Todd's been involved in the past, so I, I bet you he gets assigned. So, we're working on it. And that's kind of my update. I read the old contract and all the revisions by the Public Safety Committee today. Um, any questions about police contract? Hearing none. Next uh, agenda item, LUC 190504, second presentation and action based on LUC recommendation of GVS letter of non-objection for a change to Title 21, Chapter 9, relating to material extraction from existing claims in area zones, Girdwood Open Spaces and Girdwood Development Reserve, Michelle McNulty, Dave Whitfield. So who's gonna talk on this? I guess I can. Um, and look at you or one, Mike. It's one world for both. <laughs> Who are you on? You can do it. I'll, okay. I'll just, um, I'll just criticize for the moment. <laughs> Mike can fill in. Um, so there is a uh, assembly amendment or uh, AO uh, assembly ordinance uh, up tomorrow night um, for the discussion on. Um, so what happened was is that uh, it was discovered through the permitting process that um, DOT um, and his contractor, in particular Granite, uh, wanted to activate old claims and, and mining resources along turning an arm. Um, when they went to go file their applications with DNR and then also with the Muni, it was discovered within Muni code um, that these weren't allowable uses within the Gerwood open space um, designation. And so what planning department is trying to do is change the men code to allow those uses uh, within it um, because of the fact that uh, those, those mining claims or those mineral extraction resource uh, claims existed before um, the code was written. Um, and also they're trying to basically avoid a lawsuit that they feel they're going to lose because those um, claims trump um, what was here, the way it was explained by, by uh, planning. So um, in front of you is the AO, um, and it sort of describes the changes that are going on there in these federal patents um, and, and state patents and, and federal mining claims. Um, and how it works within those areas. There's also a map within the packet, the, stat, the, the meeting packet, that shows what these claims are. Um, uh, if, if you're aware, one of the claims that they have in here is um, uh, the one that's at the end of the wagon wheel trail at the base of Orca, um, coming from Virgin Creek, going that direction. When you hike out there to the end, you end up there, and it's, it's basically a old gravel pit. And that's owned by DOT. And then um, uh, I believe most, most of them are state owned, um, either between DOT and Alaska Railroad. So that's my synopsis. Um, I don't, I'm just representing uh, what I've heard at, at three meetings as this has been presented. Mike, do you have any further follow up? Well, I mean, it's. Clarifications? So the two things I'd say is this is, um, this kind of represents a drafting error, which is being fixed. Um, when the code was put together, there was a, um, there should have been a full analysis of all existing mineral claims, and I, it was only partially done, so this is filling in the gaps. Um, as Kyle said, there's, there's no way of using this code to stop anything from happening because it's just going to get trampled by the rights which already, it'll, it'll get dismissed by the rights which already exist. Um, this doesn't, this act doesn't open anything up, it doesn't allow any more claims, it's just recognizing the ones which exist. Um, and if, if and when, because um, I think there is an intent to use one of the Kern Creek sites um, for mineral extraction, uh, when that comes through the process, there'll be another public process for opening that up. That's my understanding anyway. 
Um, so this is kind of a, you know, I mean, I've been two minds about it, but it's a, uh, it's very much kind of something we have to do to, uh, to sort of dot I's and cross T's. Dave came forward when asked about well, exactly where does the public have an opportunity to comment on this since as it was stated this is correcting a clerical error for other districts do allow for these state and federal mining claims to in patents to be recognized but should this project move forward we all know that 75 to 90 is going to continue moving on there's probably a need for gravel in the future um, he pivoted and focused that any um, questions about permitting be ruled through the DNR permitting process so that when there's an actionable item about permitting that that's the time by which DNR would take the comments on any potential mitigation or best management practices that would otherwise assess the visual impacts or other uh, impacts from that existing claim being further mined for any other future use along the air, uh, along the area so it was pivoted that this is purely clerical that any future action or any visual impacts would be volleyed to the actual DNR process because that's where the actionable item would be. Questions? Yeah, Brian? Um, yeah, actually, um, one thing you might want to keep in mind about that, which I kind of discovered recently, is that uh, DNR has been particularly unresponsive to public comment regarding that. And my understanding is that at least some of these cases about material sites extractions, they're not even required to respond to public comment, let alone mm -hmm. account for it. So my comment that I was going to, that was my comment just about that, mm -hmm. to keep that in mind, which is very unfortunate, uh, especially for River, because we potentially have some of these out there which could impact our community from anything from traffic safety to uh, noise in the valley. Um, it doesn't appear that they sort of have to pay attention to anything we say.
think this was the public a hearing is tomorrow. The, well, those groups say every six Okay. Because this seems to be just a clerical. It doesn't matter what we do. I think they're going to do it anyway. The assembly will. But you know, if there is some leverage, as Brendan suggested, that we can at least get some sort of better you know, communication between the DNR and the DOT, that would be great. John, uh, for your edification, there are state regulations governing how the Division of Mining, Land, and Water shall respond to public comments, but it depends on the type of project. They have those that are considered small projects versus those that are large projects, and a lot of it sometimes they pass on to the entity that's looking to permit that gravel, and that would be a DOT. So the lack of communication and responsiveness um, for a public comment for an action that hasn't happened yet from our lovely neighbor DOT is not surprising to me. Um, but that's usually how the buck is passed at the state level is we're just, we own it, but whomever is taking the action to mine it, it's their responsibility to govern the public process. <laughs> Makes sense. You're welcome. So, any other public comment? Hearing none, I would entertain. Does somebody want to, Mike, do you want to read this? or? Uh, it's well, we don't normally read the letters, it's not objection. Okay. So, I would entertain a motion to vote on it. Is that what we're I, Yeah, I will. You're asking us to sign it on this day, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I move, I'll move that uh, we, we write a letter of non objection. Um, I think the right time to the right time to bring up the issues is probably the public hearing in front of the assembly because there can be more interaction that way. No, it's the first time to do anything. Really? On Tuesday? Yeah. No, I'd say any emails or something like that. No, I mean in terms of rather than changing this letter, we can do it. We can change the letter. We don't typically do that. But we can change because we we can change the letter and put in our um, our concerns about past responsiveness um, in this letter, or we can do it as part of the public record in the assembly level. Because this, you know, it's, it's really hard on the Tuesdays to do much. We can do little amendments and things, but you know, we, it gets too complicated in that form. So then we postpone it, we put it off the committees and so on, or sessions and all that. We do the actual work. Is that what you mean? Not quite. I mean, through that, through the assembly process, rather. Than, I mean, we can, we can, we can modify this letter and just point out that we found in the past there's been very poor response to public comment um, that for those for those particular sites. Um, we can do that as well, and then bring up the same issue when it goes through the assembly. I mean, typically that's done by comments beforehand, and then action and response from. Um, parties during the assembly meeting. So, so okay, so in that case I'm going to propose, I will first of all propose that we send a letter of non-objection. Okay, and that's do you second. want to specify? Well, if that's seconded, then I will, then I will okay. propose an amendment to that. Right, and then I will now propose an amendment. Further discussion. Um, now we have further discussion. <laughs> I, can, I, can I propose an amendment, we add a paragraph. Um, Pointing out a, that we have we we have concerns over the responsiveness of uh, the DNR and DOT in previous uh, attempts at opening up that money plan or the mineral extraction plan. Second. Okay, so we have a uh, motion for a non-objection with an amendment to the non-objection that's in front of us. Further discussion? Hearing none. Call for a vote. All in favor. And of, the, of the amendment. Of the amendment. So we'll put in appropriate language. Yeah. yeah. And now, are we going to vote on the amendment? The, the well, we have to have questions. Is there any questions on it? <laughs> okay. The amended motion. You're the chairing this. I'm not not, okay. This. So <laughs> now we have just voted on the amendment to the letter of non objection. And so I'm asking if there's. We've also got on the floor a vote for the letter of non-objection. So, any more discussion? Hearing that, let's vote on the letter of non-objection. All in favor with the amendment. I think we did that right, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, next on the agenda. 
sorry, and I did follow up with that. So um, I'm going to just get get your comments, Brennan, and then we'll add this to the letter and send it. Thanks for doing that. Uh, number eight is liquor license transfer from Judd all the silver to Raleigh. And um, I don't know if Raleigh you want to speak to this, but we, could, we don't have to do too much other than prove it. Do you want to get up and talk, Raleigh? I don't, I don't, I don't much to add to the actual agenda. It's pretty straightforward rather than the agenda item. It's the transfer of Judge and Cosby to all the silver, which is
So resolution supporting Secure Trash Ordinance AO 2019-74S and requesting municipal manager and Anchorage Assembly designate Goodwood Valley Service Area as a Secure Trash Regulation Zone. Whereas Girdwood is a small and densely developed community situated at the heart of prime brown and black bear habitat and whereas the people of Girdwood understand the responsibility to the wildlife whose home we share and seek to minimize human bear conflict and whereas Girdwood is a resort community with a large number of second homes, short term rental properties and other temporary visitors and whereas the community of Girdwood has experienced a recurring conflict with bears in our community sorry I'll fix the repetition uh, with six bears killed by ADF&G in 2018 and whereas almost 90% of Girdwood's residential customers for curbside waste pickup already choose to use bear resistant trash carts and whereas following multiple public meetings during the summer and fall of 2018 Girdwood Board of Supervisors passed resolution 2018-18 requesting the assembly mandate bear resistant containers in Girdwood and whereas the current municipality of Anchorage code lacks clear and enforceable measures requiring trash to be secured from bears, and whereas the MOA through the Assembly has introduced the Secure Trash Ordinance to require improved trash handling throughout the municipality, including a mechanism for the municipal manager to designate secure trash regulation zones where bear resistant trash storage is mandatory. Therefore, Good Good Board Supervisors supports AO 2019-74S and requests that on the passage of the that on passage the municipal manager and the assembly designate Goodwood Valley Service Area as a secure trash regulation zone at the earliest possible opportunity. Side etc. So if there are any questions we can speak to what the you know the details I think John and probably Anne Adam and I can speak to the details of what this ordinance will actually do. Um, but from our local point of view it basically means that um, all trash containers have to be uh, have to basically be bear resistant. Um, so if you're if you're um, using an Alaska waste canister, they already provide bear the new design of bear resistant canisters. I think they gave us a figure of at least 86 percent of, uh, of um, residents here use them already. It's probably gone up a bit since that number. Um, so there isn't a, there isn't going to be a huge change. It just means that the last few people who are not using them will be basically have to use them. Um, it also means that um, commercial use, so a lot of the dumpsters around here, um, they will be required to be bear resistant. Um, and there's also uh, requirements that people actually use them properly. And if people don't use them properly, it ultimately falls onto the um, onto the manager or owner of the property. And there is a mechanism of fines which can get very steep very quickly. And I think first offence is $150, I think. $100. Second offence, $250. Third offence, $500. That's per day. So um, you know, $500 a day adds up fairly quickly. Actually, that first hundred dollars you can remedy by getting yes. a better car. So, yeah. so the intent isn't to raise money. The intent, the intent is to uh, is to encourage um, good trash handling um, techniques, primarily by having better resistant canisters in the first place. But the, the current code is kind of things are all over the place, and it's almost impossible to enforce. So, cleaning up the code means this is now enforceable, and it does what we want as a community. Further questions? Anybody have any questions, comments from the board, from the public? I've got a resolution, I've got a second. Hearing no further discussion, all in favor? Okay, next up, new business. Item agenda LUC 190604, introduction of Valley Esca Nordic Spa Project, Marco. Can I, I uh, made a disclosure at the beginning? Can I have a rule on that? So my, my spouse is um, is an employee of um, Z Architects. So I have at least a, a potential conflict. And I don't know that we have to vote on it because we are nothing we're voting on tonight. And this because it's new business, is that correct? It is new business, but it's going to be a discussion topic going forward, so it's just good to get the opinion of the board out of the way on this topic. So okay. you can rule as a chairman if you think to think, or otherwise the board can vote. I would prefer that the board as a whole vote on conflicts. I see it not as a conflict because the group's not required, the applicant's not required to get anything from us. They're just looking for a letter of 
of support to accompany a packet, and this is new business, so no real discussion occurring here tonight. I have no problem with it. Okay. Um, I would entertain the motion to, I mean, how do I want to do this? We want to vote on whether there's a conflict, so. Well, if we, if it would be a, we'd either be a decision by the chair or a, uh, or a vote that it doesn't rise to be a substantial problem. At this time, I don't see it as one. That doesn't mean I'm not going to leave it open for the next time. It might be a conflict. Okay. And we'll hear it under old business. Okay. Then why would we vote today? <coughs> exactly. We would vote when we're going to vote on it. Mm -hmm. That's what I would do. <coughs> and hit. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. That's what I started. <laughs> <laughs> I can make a determination for the meeting tonight. As a chair, I don't think it's a conflict. Okay. Good determination. <laughs> <laughs> Marco, you're up. <laughs> I'm going to pull this back here a little bit so you can see. My, excuse me. My name is Marco Zaccaro. I'm with Lizzie Architects. I'm presenting on behalf of, of the Pomeroy's Pomeroy Lodging and Elias Resort for our new Nordic Spa. The Nordic Spa will be located, again, this is just an introduction, full details uh, next month, perhaps the month after that. We're still sorting through some planning objectives, but uh, the Nordic Spa will be on track day, track day, as I by the hotel Elias that this is the boundary between track day and track day. and it's a little more direct shot. And 
this also captures the people return hiking because there's a, there'll be a, a bistro restaurant here at the corner. There's going to be food beverage there too. So okay. when you do your hike, you can either go in and uh, take advantage of the amenities inside of the Murray Spot or you can hang out at the pier. Okay. Can we talk about parking capacity for day users that would not be otherwise skiing in and skiing out nor staying at Hotel so, Alaska? Uh, we're doing a parking analysis now. Uh, Al is doing it for us. Okay. And, uh, we're doing a parking analysis of the entire Right now, uh, this is track A, track B is where most of the parking is accommodated. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, an agreement between the MOA and LAS Resort to allow parking and track B for uses on track A. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to get a full understanding of uh, parking uses, uh, per current parking capacity. Uh, we've had a couple of meetings with the city. Uh, once we understand that and we understand how much parking this will require and how much People stay here already will be utilizing them, what the day usage is, then we'll understand how much more parking we would need. And how the city makes us satisfy that extra parking is a point of discussion right now. Right now, there's quite a bit of extra land and track B that's not covered by parking and that's designated. So if we feel like we need, say, 40 more parking spaces than they currently have, there's a number of strategies we can go about to getting that parking. We can either Cover the land and mm -hmm. see how this plays out and put it in the parking bay. And then it would be a great to see that if it manifests itself that we can do that parking. Then we can convert that parking bay into actual parking. Okay. So it's, uh, parking is actually the biggest component of this with the discussions we're getting with. All right, further question. Um, and I know we'll get more details on this next month, but I would like to see what we're doing, what you're proposing to mitigate visual aesthetics. There's beautiful old growth forest in there. I'm sure you're meaning a lot of the trees in order to buffer from the bright lights from North Face and from Chair 7 and from the resort right. in order to maintain the spa-like feel that you would have in a typical Nordic boardwalk mm -hmm. bathing routine with a sauna. But um, we're, you're I'm sure you know, anticipate what it's going to be right. like to talk about trees in that area because some of those hemlocks on those north, that north facing roll are gorgeous and old. Right, so the, uh, this, this part of the parcel here is the more gallery forest area. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Behind yeah. the cat. Yeah, mm -hmm. this, These are a little bit smaller, a little bit denser. Mm -hmm. Along the edge here, this is actually all water right here. So it's much more shallow than I'm anticipating. Yeah. Okay. So uh, where you're, the, the, where the cat turns around, this is actually not a very big site, but the cat turns around, the clearing is right here, and yeah. the gallery floor starts yeah. here. Mm -hmm. And then this is fairly dense, and we're still playing around with the width of this. Right now we have it at the cat uh, width, so we can groom it in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. uh, that may go away. We may make it narrower because we're not sure if we need to get a cat in there. Right now, we're looking at grooming it so the skiers come to the Audubon and get it to the second level. When the Alberg extension went in, did the water main go out further all the way down to the 5K loop? Okay, just curious because that's going to require additional water. For this, this uh, yeah, I mean, there's, this will be piled in the end. There's a water main. Okay. okay. All right, that concludes my questions for now. Thank you for letting me monopolize for a few minutes. Any other questions from the board? Where is the CPG trail right now, like the snowcat trail? So right now, uh, you packed up the bank here, so it's really hard to see. Um, this this topo line right here at the front of the building is the top of the So the CPG turnaround is right here. You can probably see the spot right there. The edge of the trees is right here, and then the, the uh, cat track goes off the corner. Right okay. There. So do they have a plan to reroute that or something? Or? That's a discussion between Brian and the Palmer. Okay. So. Oh, Marco. <laughs> I look forward to your core of the year's permit. <laughs> What's that? I look forward to you have to do a core of the year's permit for that no. one? No. All the wetlands are on these two red ones. Okay. And you don't have any planned and construction are, staging or anything? What's that? No planned construction staging area over there? No. Okay. 
you know, the intent is to minimize, the, you know, because the idea behind this order is called the system. Yeah. You maintain the force as much as possible. Which is why we hold the, the most of the building. There's going to be some pretty bad here, but most of the building is in places where there's not trees. Any comments from the public? <coughs> Questions? Julie? This will be a two story, so the top of this building will be about the same height as the top of the current building. So, right now, the mass in the roof on here and here is, is the same height because the trend is actually about a three story building. So, the so these are much lower than these are the top story. These are, you know, if we're, this building here is like a 700 square foot, so on. So, it's like a small house. Lighting, it would be a lot of low, a lot of dark sides. I mean, the whole intent is not to go out there and put your light on this. Any other questions? Thanks, Marco. Sure. And we'll see you again in a meeting in the future. Next on the agenda, discuss agenda topics for MOA G Rory meeting, which is scheduled for July 29th at Acre City Hall. Do we have Margaret? Margaret's not there. Do we have anything yet on the agenda, Kyle, that you know of? Uh, no, nothing yet. It's new new business, so we can just mention that we are going to be working on the police contract. Obviously, we can mention that we're going to be working on the contract for the fire department. I would like to discuss temporary impound yard for special events. Since we discussed it with Tommy and we were in too short of suspense in order to set up a temporary impoundment yard for any parking um, for future events, I think I'd like to talk about that. And then anything that the Girdwood Fire Department mentioned about um, the MOA bonding for the breathing apparatus. $175,000 since they're bonding for it. She was potentially looking at <coughs> them paying for it, not us. Which would be part of the contract, I think. Okay. And she, I would, she would usually there if she's around. Okay. And we'll then have her bring that up. we also, the last time we met with them, we talked about um, potentially rezoning for the CDC so that we could get parking in there. The assembly could waive it because they have a record of recognizing the unique instances within Girdwood. Do we need to talk about anything for the CDC? John Bell was in and at this point, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. I grew up on Department of Defense uh, cantonment area, so they were called Child Development Centers. So that's how I know them. We could probably call them Little Bears. Well, I always mess that up and say Three Bears instead of Little Bears. <laughs> so, um, is that parking issue resolved? Uh, no, I mean we're working concurrently with what Mike's working on for this. So we have a change in we have a change in code anyway for uh, for on-site parking. That's what we're going through. Right, and that we'll will cover little that. bears. Um, it will reduce the it will reduce the parking requirements. It doesn't mean it will be, it's guaranteed to fit in there. There are other specific issues on that side. Yes, I think it will. But uh, there are other specific. So I would say we we should have on the agenda little bears just as a general. Topic for we want to bond and we're working on parking and yeah. what we're doing. I think we have a general discussion about bonding, which uh, yes. covers multiple aspects. Because we have cemetery to think about as well coming up. Okay. Any, any other municipal? I'll have more next time. Yeah, I'll probably think of some too. So we'll have a, another meeting before that meeting. Uh, okay, next on the agenda. GTC request of GBOS resolution of support for KMTA grant for signage on Beaver Pond, California Creek, Abe's Trail with assistance by Eagle Scout candidate Micah Wedding King. Wedding King. Wedding King. Wedding King. Wedding King. I know He's right there. I just can't say it. <laughs> Can, uh, Carolyn's going to talk, I guess. Yeah, hi. <laughs> this is Carolyn Brodine again, Chair of Trails Committee. Um, 
So Kate Sandberg, one of our vice chairs, took upon herself to pursue a project of getting some new signage on our trails, and we she decided to start with um, Beaver Pond Trail. It's It's got everything we need for a good um, start for some new trail signage in Girdwood with a um, trailhead there at Beaver Pond Trail and then the two offshoot trails of California Creek and Abe's Trail. Um, one reason it'd be nice to get some little more signage is with the new trapping order ordinance. Um, one of the things is offshoot trails, as long as they're signed, would be still recognized as a true trail, you know, versus just an offshoot trail that a trapper might think they can just put a trap on or something. So. Um, Anyway, we are uh, we formed a subcommittee and we're starting to do uh, all the gather all the information for a grant. And then, when we are just starting to organize, we are approached by um, local resident Micah Weddy King, who is um, looking for a project for his Eagle Scout candidacy. And so now suddenly we have all this great help. Um, Mike is helping with gather information for our grant, and. Um, then he's going to actually, with the help of his troop, install the signs after we get the grant. And so um, this is just an introductory asking for a um, resolution of support from the GBOS to include in our grant application. And the grant is due, do you know when it's due, Micah? It's going to be the first week of August. First week of August. So we'll be back in July. So. Well, we'll be back in July, and then we'll vote on a resolution of support for this. Yeah. And the timing to put the signs in then will be this year? When's I think the, when's next the year. project? Yeah, it'll be next, next spring. Yes. So, any more questions? I would just say that there's strong support for this when we discussed signage at um, our meeting in April. There was mm -hmm. a good response from emergency uh, responders being able to have uh, visitors to our community identify what trail they were on, but also um, since the municipality has done such a, a great job at their signage so that people can differentiate between Coastal Trail or between Chester Creek or any of the others, it's something that we could um, follow here and it also sounds like we've got the support of our neighbor, the Forest Service, to, to move forward on the signage. So yeah. everybody wants it and there's really good rationale and reasons for it and there's already a, like a set standard to, to go by. So mm -hmm. all of yeah, these fall into place. We're definitely going to have those emergency um, locator locator mm -hmm. finds. One of Micah's jobs is to talk to Chief Weston and <laughs> find out the requirements. Do you mean trail walk is distance walk? I, well, at this point, I think we're only going to have them at, well, at the trailhead, um, California Creek, Abe's Trail, and then at the intersection of the bike path. Right. Um, we are also going to, of course, fix that sign down there that's always pointed in the wrong direction. <laughs> <laughs> we have a sign down there. So. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. See you in July. Thanks, Franco, for volunteering. Um, MOA land use permit 2014 13 2019 renewal. No fee agreement for park and ride to be signed by myself. And in the packet, we have this long contract which we have signed before, correct? Correct. It's always when you look at the contract, it says that we're going to pay the so, property tax and stuff like that, but essentially all it is is... So, um, yeah. one change that I will be making is that we won't have the Gerwood Board of Supervisors sign it. It will be the Gerwood Service Area, comma, MOA sign it. Because the Board of Supervisors aren't actually um, daily managing this facility. It's myself, and so it should be signed in the end by a staff person. But the reason we bring it in front of you is that it is an expense to the service area to manage this park and ride uh, location. It is HOB property. It was created and it was handed over to the service area to maintain. And we maintain it. You know, it has a nickname of being the park and dump. We tow cars out of there. We chase cars out of there. We paint the stripes. We clean it. And we plow it. So, um, we're just putting this in front of you to make sure that you want to continue with the funding for this uh, lease and um, and moving forward uh, there. So, what if we don't? What if we 
we decided we don't want to? Well, it'll probably fall back to HLB. Okay. It'll be a very interesting discussion. I don't want Robin mad at us. <laughs> Trails kind of too. You know, I think it was the reason that this is just sort of a technicality because it is owned by HLB and through a parking study um, development uh, or something, we ended up with a parking right there. I actually don't know the back history on it, but. Um, it does help with all the parking counts in town that they have the park and ride there for all these businesses who have all different sort of needs. Um, so um, it's not used as much, but someday in you know down the road, that corner of, uh, of Holmgren and Gerwood Place will develop at some point. Somebody there will be an effort at some point in time. Those lots will develop probably with business, and then that will become a valuable spot. It does at times. You know, a busy summer day, and the laundromat's really busy, and Thriftwood's going, and and the new pharmacy's going. You'll see cars parked in there. You see RVs parked in there, and then they go over to the restaurants and things like that. So it does have a purpose, you know. But for me, I probably spend more time dealing with the nuisances that happen in that, that parking lot. But it is what it is. And uh, my, and we're not voting on it tonight. But my recommendation probably to you would be sign the agreement again so that we continue to keep it clean and functional. The question I asked last year, and I'll ask it again, is uh, why don't, why doesn't the HOV, uh, HOA, sorry, why doesn't uh, HOV just transfer it over to us and have it as part of the uh, part of rent? Or street maintenance. Or street maintenance, yeah, yeah. in either case. I don't know. I actually sure I'd ask that question. <laughs> but we I'll can't we'll follow again. up on it. And see, it's a process probably, and this is so. But it's a process doing this every year or so. Yes, but by much quicker and simpler by doing this versus a transfer of land ownership, because you would have to go through the Heritage Land Bank and the assembly and all that. So. Yeah, but, but we do there's, it some, there's something on the agenda almost every assembly meeting where they're giving up a little piece of land for the AWWU or an easement here or an easement there. The assembly signs. Yeah. But it's something to ask. Yeah. The other aspect is parcel. So that parcel would have to be subdivided right. yes. and, so and separated out. So um, I do not want to take on the rest of the parcel. Uh, we have a good relationship there when we have vagrants or anything within the parcel next to the creek. And I'd rather for HLB to keep managing that. It's not something I want to put into the park's parcels at this point in time. That's just my point of view on that. So it gets complicated, you know. Yeah. So by renewing a lease each year, um, I'm not suggesting we do it before this runs out. I'm suggesting we look at that for a, as a longer term potential solution. Yes. Because at the other side, there's there's complexity now. If something were to happen there, and there was there was some issue about who has responsibility, then it becomes a we're managing some other entity owns it. It becomes more complex. About it. Correct. And like it says, hazardous materials and stuff like that, that we're responsible. For and there's that. a very and then all of a sudden there's a liability. And yeah. There's a very good thing in here where we're, we're you know, part of the MOA is saying we're not responsible, it's responsible by the MOA right. instead. <laughs> That's the complexity of the municipality in general where you have uh, Heritage Land Bank, which is an entity of the MOA, but then departments within the MOA have to, they're leasing from the MOA, it, you know, and so it's just these layers of... And then we have a school district as well. Technically, it's not involved. Yes, they're, but they're just right up the road. Okay, this is new business, so this will come up again next time. Uh, we'll change it to say that the municipality, municipal liaison will sign it, rather my name on there. Service area manager. Service area manager, thank you. Uh, next up, there's two pending items. One is the parking, which we're just going to... These are no business items, so we just keep them on here until they come back. Margaret does a great job of not forgetting about them. Okay. So it's going to be better if they're someplace written down. At some at some point, and this is also sometimes for the petitioner to let them know that we're, we're we know they're out there. We're just waiting for the like for example the uh, dimensional variance on 159 Aspen. We're just waiting for that staff packet to arrive someday, and then we set them back on the agenda. So. Okay, so that's that. The next thing is the joint meetings. We uh, set a tentative date for the GBOS GFR joint meeting for October. Uh, the LUC joint meeting, uh, any suggestions? I think the land use talked about um, 
looking at August or September again. So we'll pitch it again if there are still no agenda topics. There's no reason to hold a meeting. So I guess Mike, you could bring that up. Yeah. One of the future meetings. Um, any further business that needs to be done this evening? If not, I would entertain a motion to. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. Aye. Before nine. <laughs> wow. It's summer. <laughs> <laughs> nice.